Hi, the, the following notes are regarding the Intolerable Acts and most specifically the Boston Tea Party. On your screen you should see the pumpkin background tone notes of the Intolerable Acts. The first thing I um, asked you guys to do in class is to um, write down um, on this particular slide in your packet the, uh, near the Intolerable Acts that this is a nickname that the colonists themselves would have given um, these Acts of, of Parliament, these laws created by Parliament. Most specifically, we're talking about 1773-1774 range um, that are going to specifically deal with two groups of people. One, um, residents um, in and near Boston, Massachusetts. And then, strangely, very far away, it's going to deal with people that live in Quebec, um, a former part of New France. And Ohio is going to be involved in this discussion as well. So the intolerable acts, the idea of not tolerating or not standing something, this is a nickname that we, being the colonists, are going to give these pieces of legislation that are actually named something else. They have a, uh, also a cool name, things like the Coercive Acts and the Quebec Acts. And I'll show you that uh, the Coercive Act plus the que Quebec Act actually equals the Intolerable Act. That's, that's history math for you right there. We're also going to be talking about the Boston Tea Party. Uh, many of us are very familiar with colonists, the secretive Sons of Liberty, dressing up like Indians and the party more or less being a costume a protest party. Um, we're going to talk about destruction of property, trespassing, and violation of royal law. Uh, we're going to talk about consequences to actions, but let's jump right in right away and talk about tea. In 1773, the Parliament passes the Tea Act of 1773, and what this is going to do is it's going to provide an indirect uh, set of, of, of policies that are going to favor one particular company, and that is the East India Tea Company. Um, this is a company that has direct ties to Parliament. There is money tied up in this company that Parliament um, is, is connected to. Some members of Parliament are going to be making money from this piece of legislation which is probably collusion or corruption, meaning if the company does well, some of these members of parliament are going to do well. This is not going to go over well in the colonies because it is going to artificially lower the price of one particular brand of tea, and that is tea from the East India Company. All other tea is going to be unable to compete with this because uh, taxes would be eliminated on the East India Company product, and taxes would remain consistently high on other products that the colonists would have purchased. And part of the political message behind this is going to be powered by the Daughters of Liberty, uh, who are going to come up with nice quotes and slogans like, we'll part with our tea before we part with our freedom, we'll part with our tea before we part with our liberty. So there's almost a play on words right there. Um, this is going to lead to a different type of boycott or a work stoppage Many of the members of Sons of Liberty are going to encourage dock workers. So these are employees at local ports. Their job would have been loading and unloading ships. Would have been a really good job, a lot of consistent work. Still a really good job today um, in large coastal ports. They're going to encourage these workers to just not unload or load any of these East India tea ships. And uh, effectively, their idea is that this tea is going to sit in these ships long enough that the company is going to ship them somewhere else um, or they're going to send them back to England. That act of defiance is going to have definite effects. Um, there we go. So uh, Governor Thomas Hutchinson of, of Boston in Massachusetts Bay, this is a guy that has to defuse the, the Boston Massacre when the, the Sons of Liberty are raising a riot through town. He convinces Sam Adams and John Hancock to call off the dogs and, and to get the, the town back in order in exchange for allowing these, the Redcoats to be put on trial. Well, Hutchinson's thrown into the fire again. Um, it seems like he's always one step away from possibly either being shipped to England himself um, or being hung in his front yard. He's had his house destroyed and looted. Um, this would have been <laughs> a really tough position to have, particularly for a guy that grew up in the colonies, but is seen as um, the, the closest representative of the king and parliament here in the colonies. He's under orders from parliament to have three ships in Boston that belong to the East India Tea Company 
unloaded and um, he is to use force if necessary uh, to make sure that those workers do their job and unload the tea or to use royal troops to unload the tea as well. Um, members of the Sons of Liberty do find out about this um, rule, um, excuse me, this order from Parliament to do this and they decide they need to take action. So on the evening of December 16th, 1773, this is where we dress up as Indians. Um, these men would have dressed up as mohawks, um, brandishing tomahawks and feathers and war paint, yelling war cries as well. They board the ships and they throw 342 large chests of tea. And don't think about nice little Lipton tea bags or little canisters of tea. These are incredible crates and chests and barrels of tea that are cracked open and spilled into Boston Harbor, effectively making uh, Boston Harbor the largest um, cold brew cup of iced tea the world has ever seen, uh, to date, I believe. So that would be a fun claim to make. Um, this is not an innocent act because this act of defiance is clearly trespassing on property that is private, uh, taking and destroying property that does not belong to them, and also it's an incredible act of defiance to the royal governor in Boston, who's charged to do a job and to keep the peace, and also to Parliament, who at this time uh, does not have time for any of these shenanigans um, from what they see as unruly colonists, and remember, they see people in Boston as being the most unruly of them all. It's important for us to talk about a little bit of changing of the guard, so to speak. Um, it's around this time that we're going to see um, a change in tenure uh, at the prime minister position. Lord North is going to be um, running the show, so to speak, on behalf of King George III. We talked in class about this growing trend in the colonies of there not being a, a, clear, a clear knowledge of whether or not King George III knows what's going on, um, has any role of what's going on um, at all. Some people are making claims that King George III has either been kidnapped or detained or has somehow been uh, coerced himself um, into believing that something else is going on. There's this idea that he's like the, the kind king that somehow has been lied to by his ministers and by parliament. So much of this frustration is still being uh, directed specifically at the Prime Minister, the ministers of the King, and the Parliament um, themselves. So Lord North is going to be the new bad guy. And you can see him in his nice majestic robes um, in the portrait on this slide. Colonists are still going to be writing letters and petitions to King George III, um, asking him to kind of wake up or to take back the reins of the country because in their minds... Truly a just king would not have settled for the way that Parliament has been and will continue to treat the colonists going forward. On this slide, I use some of this alliteration. Parliament punishes the party purposely. Oh, that's great language right there. Um, They're going to pass the Coercive Acts of 1774. Specifically, it's going to do a couple things. One, Boston Harbor is going to be closed effectively, meaning no imports or exports going into Boston Harbor that's going to be enforced with an increased level of redcoats in Boston to basically starve this large city into submission. Um, you know how it is when, when a teacher takes away privileges of all students in order for one or two students to step up and tell the truth. Parliament wants the city to turn over the Sons of Liberty. Uh, Parliament wants this city to reject this rebellious attitude in order to get back on track with regular day of life. And, and some people in the town are not going to be able to take the coercive acts. They're either going to leave or they're somehow going to favor the royal governor and the Redcoats and Parliament specifically. Um, Parliament wants their money back for the damaged goods. They lost um, profits for the East India Tea Company. And also, as a matter of principle, the cost of those 342 chest of tea would have been about the modern day equivalent of a million dollars. That is a lot of money now. It's a lot of money then. And imagine the ability of people in Boston to pay back a debt without being able to have an economy. Because if there's no imports or exports going into Boston, the people that live there are going to find it really hard to make any money. So paying back that debt is going to be quite, quite difficult. Um, additionally, Going forward, all public meetings um, and gatherings are banned. 
um, which is going to strike a nerve at the colonists because their ability to speak freely in public and to meet and assemble, um, whether it be at a tavern, a church, or at the Liberty Tree or Liberty Pole, is something that they believe they have guaranteed from the English Bill of Rights. And now Parliament is restricting something that they believe they have embedded um, in the Constitution, in their English Constitution. And then additionally, there will be no more trials of royal officials or troops in the colonies. Parliament is taking a stand and saying, we realize what happened with the Boston Massacre, and no longer will anyone that represents the Crown or Parliament uh, be going on trial. Now, at the same time, Parliament's going to do something a long way away from Boston. They're going to give rights um, and give opportunity to people that live in Quebec, which is um, north of present-day Ohio, uh, in, in uh, former New France. And a lot of the people that live here um, are French Canadian ancestry. So uh, they are holdovers that have joined Great Britain um, just because after the French and Indian War they just decided to live there. So they became subjects of Great Britain. Uh, and Parliament is going to give them opportunities to move into the Ohio River Valley, a place that the colonists were not allowed to go uh, because of the Proclamation of 1763. Parliament is now going to give them the opportunity to settle these places that have been traditionally off limits to everyone else. They're also going to allow them to have um, religious freedom, and many of these um, Quebecois, as they will be referred to, are Catholics. So uh, the colonists are seeing Parliament favor um, a religion that is not very common as a majority religion. They're also going to see um, Parliament allow these Quebecois to uh, move into lands that have been off limits to them. So this is a slap in the face. So partnered with the coercive acts that are specifically affecting the residents of Boston and around Boston, Massachusetts Bay, and the Quebec Acts of 1774, these two pieces of legislation are going to be called the Intolerable Acts. Now let's talk about ways that they responded. Um, we still don't have colonists um, asking for independence, and that's important for us to remember. Like I said previously in this presentation, most colonists still believe the king has no idea that things are this bad. If they could just find a way to let the king know just how bad it is, surely a just king would step in and correct the wrongs of parliament. At the same time, you've got a third of the population that's incredibly loyal to Parliament. They're saying it's not our job to judge the legality or the righteousness of laws. We must follow the laws. And a lot of these people are connected to Parliament as well. Families were very well inter interconnected. And they don't want to be seen as unruly or going against the rule of Parliament or the king. Uh, you've got a third of the population that just doesn't care at all what's going on because they live in the remote frontier areas or they're more focused on uh, making a living for their family or working with, with people that live in the frontier like Indian tribes. They're not really connected in the empire anymore, especially if they're settlers that have illegally crossed the mountains and have gone west into the Ohio River Valley or into present-day Kentucky or Tennessee um, or even into present-day Alabama uh, and, and uh, far west Georgia. Um, and then you have this group of people that, that is rebellious, is acting like Parliament's version of spoiled children. Um, they're still not talking about independence. They still need to send messages to Parliament in order for them to reverse course. The idea of independence would have been um, incredibly scary because not only is it treasonous, and they surely would have been targeted uh, as traitors and executed, their property and family uh, seized, their family in prison, um, it just is a bad idea because you just don't create a country in the 1700s and everything works out well. The idea of that country having success and working, uh, not very bright. And we'll continue to talk about that theme um, economically and politically moving forward. Uh, we, we have reinforced evidence, like the song that we're going to sing in class, The Bold Americans, which reinforces that colonists are asking the king to step in um, and to help them recognize their goals of those two thematic desires, to, to have a voice in Parliament, that echoes back to Ben Franklin's statements in the Albany Plan of Union in 1754, as well as Boston Attorney James Otis's 
um, legal arguments that taxation without representation goes against the English Constitution and the Bill of Rights, um, and also this desire to be respected and to fully have your rights recognized as an Englishman. We are going to see a change in direction, and that's going to be a coalition building similar to the Stamp Act Congress, and that's going to be the Continental Congress, and this is a desire for unity. The first of these will meet in Philadelphia, 1774, in September. Fifty-five representatives uh, representing 12 of the 13 colonies. Georgia doesn't come. Thanks a lot, Georgia. Um, this is 20 years after the Albany Plan of Union, and that we finally have some unity coming together. And we need um, to work together. You know, in this slide, we talk about Patrick Henry, who starts saying things like, "We are, we cannot be Virginians. We cannot be Pennsylvanians. We cannot be uh, Bostonians and Massachusetts. We we need to be uh, Americans, and not in the sense of a new country, but continentals. We must work together." Um, they would be would have been referred to as provincials, people from provinces in England. So a sense of uni unity and awareness throughout the group. This Continental Congress is going to do a couple things. The first thing that they're going to do, to do is they're going to work together to draft a statement calling for the total repeal of the 13 Acts of Parliament that deals with taxation and rights since 1763. So that's pretty bold. Dear Parliament, the following things since 1763 are illegal, unwanted, and awful. You need to overturn them completely and then we can get back to normal um, these actions from the colonial point of view violate the colonists rights that are embedded in the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights additionally they want to renew a total boycott of any and all English goods and they want colonial leaders to send back products in ports um, back to England and then finally they pass something called the Suffolk Resolves Suffolk is a fun word to say Suffolk is spelled Suffolk, and it's pronounced Suffolk. It's um, referring to an area in, in Massachusetts, Suffolk County, which includes Boston. This is a resolution passed by the Continental Congress, September 1774, 12 of the 13 colonies present. It is a pledge to support the residents of Boston that are very concerned that they are under armed guard and they want to arm themselves with local militia groups. And this Suffolk Resolves is a step in the direction of allowing people to defend themselves against Great Britain. Um, if Great Britain would send aggressive troops, and remember, a lot of these people think that the troops in Boston are under the control of almost like a Star Wars evil empire, that Parliament and the ministers of the king have an evil agenda that is targeting the colonists, specifically those in Boston. And surely the king doesn't know about this. So the troops would sometimes be referred to as um, ministerial troops, um, almost like evil galactic stormtroopers. So the Suffolk Resolves would have allowed um, people in Boston and surrounding Boston to arm themselves, train and drill, gather muskets and rifles, gather cannon and gunpowder in order to train and defend themselves from a possible attack from Redcoats. Now, the Continental Congress is going to do some other things, and eventually they are going to grow into our first American government with the Second Continental Congress. We're a little bit away from that. Um, but these steps towards unity are important for us to recognize. They're still being done so to attain two thematic goals, a voice in Parliament, and true representation, that true respect as, a, as an Englishman. There's still uneasiness and uncertainty whether or not the king is in charge of anything at all. And now we're to the point where we're okay with us preparing to defend ourselves so that something that we think was a targeted attack at Boston Massacre from March 5th, 1770, surely doesn't happen again in places like Boston or throughout the other American colonies. So in the words of Patrick Henry, we are no longer Virginians, we are no longer New Yorkers or Pennsylvanians anymore, we are surely Continentals or bold Americans, except for Georgia, who doesn't like to come to meetings. Thanks and have a great day.